All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I mean, it's the third day of, well, fourth day technically this year of Expo, so I am very, very pleased to see that you all still made it, are all still surviving. How many people have seen everything they want to see uh, so far at Expo? You're totally lying, sir, because you're in my panel, so you haven't seen everything that you want to see. Uh, my name is Aidan Buckland. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary uh, in the Department of Communication and Culture. Um, here's part of a, a project that's been going on for the last few years here at Expo in order to essentially create a stream of talks and panels where academics like myself are able to come and actually interact uh, uh, with this fantastic audience, but also to share kind of our research interests. Um, for some of you who have been coming to Expo for uh, all these number of years, you may have seen me this uh, in this particular panel with the same name and a lot of the same slides as last year. Uh, I will assure you that uh, although the slides haven't changed that much, uh, I have in the last year. Uh, when I came to you last year, I was a PhD student, really unsure about where uh, this study would be able to take me. Um, being a candidate means that I am just weeks away now from actually going out and talking to you folks officially and starting to tell this story uh, that I want to uh, talk about a bit today. So uh, why do I suck? Well, I've got lots of reasons for that. Uh, won't go through all of them now, of course. Uh, but I wanted to start, uh, like I started last year, uh, with this notion of, of a gaming biography because we all kind of uh, have grown up and some of us are still growing up with games right now. Uh, and when you look back when you're my age, which is old, um, you will notice uh, that you see a particular biography, a bi biography that can be told with products. Uh, for me, gaming started with the Commodore VIC-20. It was a long time ago, and games were very, very basic back then. It was during one of the, the first booms in video gaming here in North America. And if you work your way around clockwise, you can see basically how my gaming is involved, has evolved. So I, I position myself as somewhere in between PC and console gaming. Uh, I very quickly became a console kid, of course, with the Sega Master System and the to Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, I followed them through. Uh, to the Super Nintendo, and of course, once I got to university, had to go buy myself a Nintendo 64, because as we all know in university, you just have lots and lots of free time. Uh, so I filled that time. And what I found in the last year, actually, uh, and in doing this type of research, when you take something that you love to do and you make it your job, uh, which is what I've done uh, for good and for ill, uh, you get to learn a lot about not only the thing that you love, but also about yourself. And I've noticed actually in the last year that I understand now why I game. Uh, it has to do with the six o'clock uh, console there, the ten Nintendo 64, and their particular uh, positioning of those four ports uh, on the front of the system. All of a sudden, gaming didn't need peripherals to have four people sitting around a TV. It didn't need lots of attachments and specialized games, which all inevitably, let's face it, sucked uh, before the Nintendo 64 started making four-player and social gaming something that was really not just in your face but accessible and actually entertaining. Uh, I actually still play Nintendo 64 games. Uh, this is another reason why I suck. Uh, <laughs> and uh, essentially, as I've evolved past then, I've noticed that social gaming is what drives me. I come from the other side of the country, uh, from Nova Scotia. Uh, I've been here for about 10 years, and I can tell you that I still actually spend a lot of time at home as a disembodied voice through TeamSpeak, through Ventrilo, through Xbox Live. This is why I game. Uh, but what's drawn me to this question is why you game. Uh, about a couple of years ago now, I guess four, uh, in August uh, 27th, 2010, of course, with the release of StarCraft II, uh, I found a game that I remembered nostalgically. I loved the first uh, game and its expansion, Brood War. I thought the story was very compelling, and I was very interested in the game style itself. I always felt that other RTSs just didn't do it right uh, after StarCraft, and even before StarCraft, in terms of how the economy worked, how tight the game was. So when StarCraft II came out, I was very excited to play it, uh, as were some of my friends. One friend in particular who hadn't actually played games in over a decade, hadn't picked up any of these systems past the Nintendo 64, hadn't played a lot of games, but remembered StarCraft fondly. So after 10 years of not having all that regular contact, uh, uh, my friend Hig and I were able to connect again through StarCraft 2, uh, which was awesome for about a month and a half. 
and this is why I suck. Because when I was playing StarCraft II, I was just playing the game. Imagine my naivete, that you could just pick up the game and play and figure it out as you go along. As I'm sure you can all imagine, by about week two, I stopped uh, being able to win. Uh, I think I was losing about 60% of our matches. By week three, it was 75. By week four, it was about 90. And to this day, I beat him about once a month, uh, if I'm lucky, and if he's really, really sleepy, thanks to time zones. And of course, this had me wondering, uh, what is going on here? And I started to ask him, because he didn't tell me right away, because it was just far too fun beating me constantly, uh, over and over again. Uh, but I had asked him, how is he doing this? And uh, you know how he was actually accessing the game or learning about this game, because I thought, hey, I've got gamer capital. I've been playing all of these systems. I've been playing the whole 10 years that he hasn't. Think about all the things that I know that he doesn't. And within a month, he knew so much more than me about this game. Uh, and it came from uh, what we all now know as eSports. Now, this happened to me in StarCraft, so I, you know, fool me once. Uh, with the original StarCraft, uh, when I first got here, I also used it as a connection to people back home, and I also had the same thing happen to me. So when it happened the second time, I really got kind of, not just peeved, but interested uh, in how this, this infrastructure was being developed. Now, the, the first thing I want to say is that uh, eSports is, is not really a big shift for video gaming. Uh, video gaming has always been competitive. Uh, if you want evidence of that, I'd still recommend The King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters, but I would also recommend Chasing Ghosts. It is a much more interesting, uh, much more character-driven, uh, person-driven uh, exposition of early gaming and competitive uh, gaming in the arcades and how that happened. Uh, Chasing Ghosts follows the Lifetime uh, magazine spread of the world's best gamers. It was taken sometime in about 1983. Uh, and uh, you would be interested to find out, if you didn't already know, if you haven't already seen it, that Calgary actually has a very unique position in this history of competitive gaming. Two of the people in that Life uh, uh, magazine spread were actually from Calgary, drove down to the, the picture shoot and uh, made their name in gaming here in this city. Uh, so I don't want to say that eSports is new. I don't want to say that it's, it's somehow different. Competitive gaming has been with us uh, since gaming was uh, uh, first conceived. Uh, and it's been with us uh, in various ways. Uh, in North America alone, uh, we saw in the 1980s a Space Invaders tournament which drew 10,000 participants. Twin Galaxies popped up shortly after that. Uh, in order to referee what was going to be official in terms of uh, what was gaming. We saw Power Fest, sorry, uh, 1990 Nintendo, Nintendo's World Cup Championships, the Power Fest 94. We picked up Steam once we got to first person shooters with Doom and Quake. Uh, the 1995 Red Annihilation uh, tournament is, of course, one of those pivotal moments where uh, John Carmack actually gave away his red Ferrari uh, to the winner of the tournament, uh, who was able to actually uh, best all of their opponents. And in 1997, of course, we get a bit of a turn. But StarCraft really does have a special place in this history of eSports uh, and this history of competitive gaming because really at the turn of the century, uh, between 2000 and 2001, eSports shifted. eSports went from being small tournaments, uh, niche kind of groups of people who were interested in this game or that game, to an actual market force, something that is huge beyond I think anybody's wildest dreams. Uh, T.L. Taylor, uh, and I'm going to recommend books for you to read uh, if you're interested in reading about how we see you and how uh, we as gamers are starting to uh, interrogate this stuff academically. But T.L. Taylor is one of the researchers who's been with gaming communities since Muds and Moods. She was in text-based environments and in dungeons, uh, plodding around and trying to figure out how those games work before she turned to, to World of Warcraft. Uh, sorry, EverQuest. Uh, I'm confusing her with someone else. Uh, she went through EverQuest, EverQuest 2, and then finally started to trip on this eSports thing. She spent about two years, three years, going from tournament to tournament, DreamHack and the MLG tournaments and the World Championships, and going from basically place to place to see what it is this eSports thing uh, was. And if you have a chance, uh, sorry, in the previous slide, her book, Raising the Stakes, is her account of that three-year journey of trying to figure out what it is that gamers are doing at these tournaments, how it is that these tournaments are organized. As she says, as it stands, the current high-end esports scene is a mix of amateur, serious, leisure, and professional orientations. There's a large number of players involved 
in either formal amateur leagues or informal organ uh, informally organized, but nonetheless skill stratified communities of play. At the other end, professionalization is most clearly at work among much smaller number of contracted players, team owners, league operators, tournament organizers, and some parts of the broadcast and journalist domain who have managed to create full-time occupations out of supporting, growing, uh, and uh, uh, fostering a professional computer game play career. This is what has happened to gaming. This is what uh, I did not know about, uh, or I at least had blocked out of my mind when I first started playing StarCraft Brood War uh, over a network with my friends and then StarCraft II after that, is that gaming is not something that we just do for fun. It's something that other people do for a job. How many people here uh, play uh, StarCraft? Excellent. This uh, I should have taken a picture. I can show my friend. StarCraft is not dead. It's not dying. All right, how about the MOBAs? Uh, LOL, Dota. You can all raise your hands. Infinite Crisis? That's the only MOBA I've tried so far. It was, it was a MOBA. Um, how about Counter-Strike? Halo? Uh, Call of Duty? So we've got an interesting mix. We've got kind of people from almost all of the constituencies, but let's just check. Do we have any European gamers here? How about FIFA? Anybody play FIFA a lot? It's an eSports game in, in the EU leagues, uh, believe it or not. Don't know why uh, uh, our sports games don't make it, but soccer did. So, as we all know, eSports is a globalized uh, uh, effort, and it's dominated by just a few professional organizations. And in fact, after this February, we can say it's a fewer professional organizations. WCG uh, closed their doors in February, or at least made the announcement that they're taking a break, which leaves us with just a few of these organizations. I think one of the things that we have to realize as gamers, uh, and I don't mean for this to kind of stumble you or stop you from loving the game, but there's only a valorized few people who are going to make it through this infrastructure. There's only going to be a few people, maybe only one or two of you in this room, that are going to ever be able to make money playing your favorite game. That doesn't mean you shouldn't play your favorite game. It's just something that I think we should have our eyes open about. Uh, when we see uh, professional tournaments, which are all streamed, when you go to Barcrafts on McLeod Trail, when you go uh, and peruse through Team Liquid's websites or wikis or reddits, just know that this might not be something that you'll be able to monetize. But if you want to follow me to the quarter horse room after this talk, I'll talk about all of the other things that you can do uh, in order to kind of seize on these skills and, and to kind of make something uh, happen of your gaming time. So my research question in general, and it hasn't really changed, is this notion of how are the practices of esports actually changing or informing the play of everyday gamers. So how is it that, that what Naniwa does or what Bomber does or what these professional gamers do informed or educated or transformed the way Hig played StarCraft versus the way I played StarCraft? How is it that those things get trickled down? How is it that they get decided? How is it that the metagame actually works? These are interesting and important questions for us to answer because I think this is the way that gamers are going to save the world because we are all in competition with each other, but we all help each other, is that we actually take these practices, we find ways of making best practices, we, we find ways of dealing with trolls, we find ways of getting through this environment in a way that's both competitive and cooperative. We find ways of finding the best in each other in these competitive environments. And I think that's important. And I think it has to do with how these practices are trickled down. I think it has to do with the pipelines and the, the, the chutes and ladders that connect what happens at MLG to what happens on your PC uh, or Mac, uh, depending on if you game with a Mac, I suppose. So what do I mean by practices? And practices. Uh, are not necessarily, well, it's actually a theoretical term, uh, and I'll try to keep those to a minimum. It's developed by a number of philosophers, and it's essentially a late 20th century idea. We've always been trying to figure out how the social world works. We always wanted to know kind of what makes this organization work over that organization. Is it these kind of social structures like governments and institutions, Is th these other things? And this practice approach is basically a way of marrying kind of all of the different approaches. It's not social structures that just dominate our lives and tell us what we do and what we can't do. 
that what you do on a daily basis, those, those little things that you do when you sit down at your PC, those things that you do when you're reading through a wiki, those are practices. Those are things that you're doing on a regular basis and they fit into wider activity flows. So the wider activity flows in the case of StarCraft of Blizzard Entertainment's uh, game sales, but also into the activity flows of esports in general. When you show up to a bar uh, and there's 250 people signed up on Facebook to go to a bar to watch a tournament, uh, which will be happening again in June, uh, that feeds into lots of other uh, activity flows. It gives that bar a, a reason to put on extra staff for a night. It gives Twitch TV uh, another subscription to, to watch uh, their stuff. And it, it helps basically a lot of people. And I would like to argue uh, within my own work that it's going to help you too. Uh, but we're going to get to that uh, as we go through. But in terms of a practice, uh, I wanted to talk uh, in specific about one and how this practice not just developed within gamer communities, but actually becomes hard-coded into the game. And that's the worker split. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with StarCraft, uh, when you start, imagine StarCraft, excuse me, you start with your command building. Uh, in this case, it's a nexus, it's that triangular thing. Uh, all of the blue crystally things on the sides are the resources that you need to build all your units, your buildings, everything you build in the game comes from those crystals and some green gassy stuff. Uh, part of the game has always been managing that economy to make sure that that economy supports the actual action type, uh, real time strategy stuff that you have to do in the game. And when StarCraft first came out, uh, these workers that you see moving, or not moving, but you see moving towards or in between the Nexus and the actual mineral line, they just sat there. So you actually had to grab them all and go through a series of mouse clicks and button presses to assign them to different stacks of minerals because StarCraft is cumulative. Every decision that you make, every action that you execute in the game has further and further uh, and more uh, impactful repercussions the earlier on it is. So, the worker split became a practice, something that professional gamers developed uh, uh, while playing in competition that gave one player an edge over another. Being able to move your workers out uh, in a fashion that had them all hitting different uh, mineral uh, patches so that none are overlapping, none are missing their, their mark, everything is going as efficiently and instrumentally as it possibly can. When StarCraft II came out, they sort of fixed that. What they did is all of a sudden, uh, your workers uh, automatically would go uh, to the mineral line. So when you build a new worker, it would automatically get spit out. You could uh, select a place on the, uh, the mineral line for your worker to go, uh, and that seemed to be a solution. But again, still there was that ne necessity to actually split up the workers. There was a necessity to move that practice along. And then as Brood War, uh, not Brood War, pardon me, Heart of the Swarm uh, was released, they went further. So we can see that how we play the game, and, and this was also echoed uh, in an earlier presentation by uh, Dr. Feng and Brendan Crosby, how we play our games can sometimes have a real impact on how those games are coded. I expect that as we get into Legacy of the Void uh, and the last of the three titles uh, in this particular series is released, the worker split will be further encoded into the game in a way that either makes it more uh, of a challenge for players to actually go about doing it or that makes it easier and, and evens that playing field. There is kind of always a tension in these gaming communities over whether or not we're making it too easy or whether we make it too hard uh, in terms of the little things that you do in the game. But as I mentioned before, uh, these things, uh, like the worker split and these practices, uh, largely fit and serve this uh, uh, goal. That is Sundance Giovanni from MLG Gaming. Uh, is marked by the industry itself. The biggest challenge is educating consumers and businesses about the ever-growing world of competitive gaming, how it's actually going to benefit them and why they would want to jump on board. And when we spread these practices, that's one of the ways in which we're helping people like Sundance uh, be able to make the money that he makes, uh, the organization uh, make the money that they make, uh, and the gaming industry itself make the money that it makes. Uh, so we are part of what we call electronic word of mouth in this particular case. Whether we post it on our own websites, our Facebook pages, link to it, like it, uh, we are creating a network essentially of connections uh, every day that we go online and every time uh, that we actually push ourselves uh, uh, in this direction. And of course, we don't do it without help. 
for those of you who play StarCraft, the person at the bottom of the screen is uh, recognizable. Sean Plot, uh, Day9, uh, is right now producing, I would say, arguably, for on-air time, about as much media per week as Oprah Winfrey. He is on your screen if you want to go to YouTube or Twitch TV or follow his channel on screen for hours a week, every single week, trying to break down what's happening in these competitions, trying to help you understand not just what it is that these professionals are doing, but why they did it, how they're doing this thing versus that thing, why they would do this thing at this point in time in the match. He breaks it down at such a level that goes beyond even what sportscasters do, which is what he does uh, when these competitions are happening, uh, in actually teaching us. He's almost like a coach. He's a distributed coach right now for StarCraft 2. Uh, and as he says, he's trying to help us be better gamers. The thing about these particular resources and the thing that always kind of struck me about it is, and this is just something that we all know now, we're never really playing alone. So when my friend Higgs starts to actually play, uh, uh, starts to watch, sorry, day nine, uh, and starts to tune into the daily and starts to watch match after match and see the breakdown and see how they work, that affects me. It totally affects me. It totally affects you. It's going to uh, impact the way you play, or at least impact the league that you're in. I'm not afraid to admit it. I started in bronze. I got all the way up to silver, and then I'm back in bronze. So. It's going to be a, a, a bit of a, a, a steep climb for me when I go into my research because I actually do want to play the game with people uh, and learn from you uh, in how you teach yourselves how to play the game, how you find these best practices, how you move through these networks. Because I think, and this is kind of where my research is going, the story that I want to tell is a story of not just individuals but how individuals plug themselves into these particular networks. How we utilize these resources on the internet, uh, through the internet, I should say, uh, in order to make ourselves better gamers, in order to make the game more enjoyable, in order to uh, help support, uh, in some cases, the game itself. So whether you're providing uh, posting to uh, Liquipedia, uh, watching uh, the actual tournaments as they happen, uh, participating on a Reddit. Uh, or just watching the daytime daily or even just playing the game you're part of this network you can't escape it uh, it's always going to be there and I think uh, working with gamers to try to map these connections to start asking questions about the significance of these connections is going to make for an interesting story because I think that like I say you're developing skills and we're developing skills as gamers that are absolutely what this world needs right now we need to be able to find ways to innovate. We need to be able to find ways to compete without turning our back on our competitors, without pulling up the ladder when we're done. And this is what we do as gamers. We write walkthroughs. We add to wikis. We converse on reddits. We suss out the metagame in our conversations and in our play. And by doing so, we're making a better game environment. Now, of course, uh, this is not to say that gaming is, of course, uh, uh, perfect or in any sort of state uh, that is good enough uh, at this point in time. There's lots of issues. Trolls, uh, if you ever go on to Xbox Live uh, and are not explicitly talking to a friend, you will notice that uh, you've entered uh, what I sometimes refer to as the sewer of human consciousness. Uh, but that being said, it's it's part of the network that we're a part of at times. If you want to play Halo 4 online, you're going to have to get through those people. And even learning that, even learning how to block out that noise, even learning how to uh, enjoy your game despite those people, or learning how to interact with those people is a valuable skill that you're going to use throughout the rest of your lives, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. depends on how you look at it. So where does this map take us? And this is one of the central questions with my thesis uh, and with my particular project, which is, you know, where can this map take us? So I draw this map, I find these practices, we figure out how it is that gamers are informing uh, themselves and it looks all wonderful and everything that I, I, I was thinking was happening was happening, that's great, so what? Well, we've got lots of big questions, uh, especially in uh, social sciences, about these notions of participatory culture. And this is the perfect venue to talk about participatory culture because, let's be honest, 
we are all participating this weekend in some way or another. If you're just walking the expo floor uh, and looking at the booths that uh, are in that big room, that's participatory culture. These are people who have found artifacts, texts, movies, books, comic books, games in their culture that they like, that move them. I just came from the panel before this uh, with the brown coats. Uh, who just with a nine episode television show and a movie have formed a not-for-profit that has given out something like thirty thousand dollars in the last four years we are moved within participatory culture to do things and i think the gamers are doing things the the question is are we wrestling control of these properties out of the hands of corporations for our own benefit i think sometimes the answer is yes and the the example i've chosen here of course is starcrafts uh, we could easily throw up red versus blue we could easily throw up seedlings and again uh, if if you want to follow me to my next talk uh, i'll be talking about all of those things as well well, but here's an example of a, a, a young man who essentially uh, likes StarCraft, uh, is an animator, uh, and decided to start making uh, short cartoons. If you uh, YouTube StarCraft, you'll get uh, his first season or so. Uh, and it's one of these fortunate times where Blizzard didn't see the need to send him a cease and desist letter. They actually helped him merchandise uh, what it is that he was, he was creating. So for that individual, here we have an example where essentially someone is able to take this IP, take the intellectual property of Blizzard Entertainment, and have their own little piece of it. Not just to experience and have fun with and tell stories with, but also to make some money off of. He's going to be making money off of the merchandise uh, that he sells with the, the, the plush toys. Of course, these are all uh, cutesy representations of the different units within StarCraft II. Uh, and much of the humor, I think, if you're a StarCraft fan, much of the humor in the first s series of episodes is about the quirks in the game. It's about the little things that we do as gamers in the game. So he's, he's, not, uh, he's having fun with it, but also being able to kind of make something out of it. Uh, but Day 9 would also fit uh, within this particular rubric. Day 9 would also be an example of someone who is an ex-player. He's an ex-professional player. Uh, he did compete seriously uh, in his youth, which I guess was his teens and 20s, because I'm pretty sure he's younger than I am. Uh, <laughs> But he's retired now and he's able to still uh, be a part of it. I remember watching, uh, very vividly watching the launch for uh, Heart of the Swarm. And of course, Blizzard did a, a big event that was broadcast, streamed out uh, online uh, through their website. And uh, as they were killing time, as the countdown clock was finally counting down to zero in the last time zone, uh, Day9 turned to, I believe it was Husky, uh, to say, isn't it weird uh, how we all had kind of different life plans? This is a man who had a plan. He had a degree from a university in Southern California, was going to go off and be uh, something or other. And on August 27th, uh, 2010, his life changed. His life changed fundamentally. And all of a sudden, his gaming, that opportunity, that door opened and he walked through in a big way and has turned his gaming into something that is not just a part of his life, uh, but is now his life, uh, and travels around, and of course uh, gives talks and goes to these uh, tournaments to be sportscaster, or caster, uh, and of course, uh, you know, spends his time uh, when he's not doing that, trying to teach us how to be better gamers. And I think that, in particular, is one perspective that uh, we should take away. The question that comes at us, though, and this is going to always dog you, uh, regardless if you're playing the game or trying to convince your supervisor that you're going to write a whole dissertation, which is a, basically a book about people playing the game, is it really participation? Are we really doing something that's transformative? Are we really doing something that is bettering all of us? Or are we just feeding the coffers of Blizzard Entertainment in San Jose, California? Are we just feeding the coffers of an industry that's already surpassed most other media industries in a time frame that is absolutely astounding? When you pull the numbers, and I, I recommend you do, uh, last year's biggest film was Catching Fire. The Hunger Games 2. Uh, it's laughable how much money that money that movie made in comparison to GTA 5, which is the best-selling game now of all time, uh, in just its opening weekend. Uh, over 600, <coughs> excuse me, 63 billion dollars one weekend. 
with GTA 5. So this is an industry that's big. It's an industry that is now powerful. And it's an industry that I think that we have a stake in, not just uh, as consumers, not just the people that are going to buy these products, but as people who are going to shape these products. And I will plug it one last time. Uh, in the quarter horse room, uh, in the next few minutes, I will be giving a, a presentation about how it is and some of the ways in which we can actually shape these games. Uh, but uh, I think I've probably talked a little bit too much already uh, about my own research. And before I start taking questions, I just want to say I will be starting the project, hopefully, if everything goes to plan, uh, this coming June or July. I do need StarCraft gamers. Uh, I need gamers of all kinds, so uh, after we're done doing the question and answer uh, session, if you're interested, um, please uh, come up and talk to me. Uh, I'll give you a card, you can drop me an email, uh, and we can talk about and negotiate uh, whether or not uh, you might want to be a part of my study. Uh, and also uh, what kind of part you would like to play. So, uh, with that, uh, questions? Okay, uh, I'll start the far right and work my way across. So, you, sir. Do you think the uh, sportscaster, the esportscaster, is going to run more, a much more important role in getting this more popular than the casual gamer? Because the casual gamer is going to be more on the games becoming too easier to be broadcast. I think that's an Excellent question. I think that in this past year, we've gotten uh, some pretty clear signs of, of kind of both of the answers. Uh, I don't want to pick on MOBA fans, um, but I think one of the reasons that MOBAs have taken off in the way that they have, uh, and I mean, let's face it, StarCraft has been competitively played for you know over 15 years uh, at this point, uh, and for 15 years, Blizzard Entertainment and uh, Kespa and other organizations have petitioned the United States government to give Korean players who are the best in the world uh, athlete visas. It took Riot you know, less than eight months to be able to convince the American government, hey guys, let's, let's do this visa thing. So I think uh, MOBAs lend themselves better to the spectacle. Uh, and I think this is something that we've seen in sports uh, before as well, in the evolution of sports. Uh, MOBAs are uh, an easier spectacle to look into. T.L. Taylor herself kind of says, walking around these tournaments, you know, first-person shooters, they make sense. You look at the screen, you can figure out what's going on pretty quickly. Sort of, at a surface level at least. MOBAs, same thing. You look at them, you can, you can tell what's going on at least at a surface level. Um, StarCraft, you look at it and often... Uh, are bamboozled because there's so much going on and there's so much going through it. But I would say the other evidence uh, that I would point to is Day9 actually doing casting for MOBAs. He's not a MOBA player. Why is he doing casting there? And I think part of that is because he's got a brand himself. Um, part of my research, and, and we're waiting right now for kind of people to get back to me, uh, I've emailed Day9, uh, and as some of you probably know, MLG is going to be in Anaheim in June. Uh, I want to go, uh, and I actually want, I've specifically reached out to Day9, uh, I want to go follow him around, uh, it's probably why he hasn't responded to my email, probably sounded kind of creepy, um, but I want to follow him around, I want to see what it is this guy does when he's at these tournaments, because I've heard all sorts of wacky stuff, I've heard, you know, he does his, his webcasts from his, his room, his bedroom, kind of the classic, you know, uh, gamer trope. Uh, I've heard that he has a green screen, and that he actually green screens his his bedroom now. So he does those things from wherever he's at, and just green screens his bedroom in there. And I think that's fascinating. That 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 is just uh, hilarious. And it, it speaks to this notion of a brand. Is that that's day nine auth authenticity? If if he was giving the talk here and he didn't have the green screen and he didn't have the bedroom, uh, would you still, in, you know? It's, it's part of, you know, kind of what he does. So I think it's a little bit of both. I think part of it is the spectacle itself, uh, how the game looks, um, how easily it is to, to visually digest. But I think the other half is, is definitely the personalities, Husky Day 9. Uh, and, and there's probably, well, the two guys that were here, Mike and Sam, uh, uh, not necessarily huge personalities, but they're professional gamers and, and automatically kind of become part of that spectacle and become personalities to draw us in. I mean, who didn't, uh, who here has heard of Idra? <laughs> he's fun to follow. Not necessarily the best gamer in the world, uh, but fun to watch because he's part of that spectacle. Uh, so there, uh, white shirt, yep. <laughs> I 
I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we as gamers face. Like I say, uh, at Xbox Live to me is, uh, at times, uh, on the voice chat, the sewer of human consciousness. Uh, it's it's racism, it's it's heterosexism, it's, it's terrible uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it's a challenge for all of us as gamers to find ways to either rise above or ignore that sort of thing. In terms of, of tournaments cracking down on it, I think um, it is something that we have to address, but I, I don't think that all gamers or gamers in general could be characterized. I think really gamers in general, and, and again, uh, as I'll speak about in a little bit later, I think we're doing lots of wonderful things that show that we're actually really cool people that do really nice things for one another uh, in a way that, because uh, um, I mean, Day Nine's an example, like he's making money out of it, but how many other people right now are posting videos on YouTube uh, trying to help you play a particular game better and it's not just esports uh, that's the thing that I, I've kind of had to let go of because esports is special I think esports does accelerate a lot of the things that we do as gamers uh, in terms of the game is never really settled it's always being perfected that said I think when we look at things like uh, gamefacts.com uh, you know here's something that that is you know we didn't want to keep paying for magazines to find out things about games. We all knew stuff about games and we start to develop these kind of pockets of collective intelligence online to share. So I think that, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, I think part of it has to do with a lot of gamers are maturing their way uh, through their gameplay. So in maturing your way through your gameplay, I mean, we have to have the patience uh, to be able to kind of accept that. Uh, but also, I think some of us have to have, and I think more of us have to have kind of the uh, the fortitude to kind of say, well, no, that's not cool. Uh, when you hear someone say, you know, what, what are you, what are you going that way for, fag? It's not cool. It's not cool. Don't say it. You don't need to say it. You can just say, hey, why don't you go this way instead? Or hey, maybe this is how you should do it better. Now, I'm not endorsing getting into these flame wars, uh, like I think Sam and Mike had pointed out in the uh, summoner school. You can engage a little bit, uh, but if you end up typing more than you're clicking. Uh, then you've already lost yourself. Uh, so they end up ruining your fun, their fun, everybody's fun around you. So, you know, I would encourage us all to engage a bit more on that sort of thing, uh, to make the gaming environment even better, because I think we can, uh, and I think we've proven uh, as a culture or as a subculture in the last 20 years that we can do a lot of really amazing stuff. Um, so I think that is just the next small hurdle uh, to kind of get over. Uh, but. How small it is, I guess, is dependent on what gaming environments you're in and, and, and what the culture's like. So that uh, sort of answers your question, hopefully. Uh, okay. Uh, you and then you. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you had looked into or thought at all about sort of parallels in competitive non-video game play. For the professional Magic the Gathering mm. has sort of got this sort of, sort of huge tournament scene going with its own casters and draw mm -hmm. In particular, um, I would say that uh, probably well, not with Magic: The Gathering uh, or with other. Uh, basically, uh, one of my one of my committee members pointed me to this kind of long-standing uh, literature, the sociology of sports and, and, and leisure. So I've looked at things like poker, I've looked at things like baseball, uh, and I think that there are definitely parallels. I think that right now um, we we have a talent consolidation going on. Uh, this happened in baseball in 1785. Basically, in the 1700s, baseball was like video games and like magic and like uh, uh, you know so many other things. It was a player-run thing. You know, players uh, became part of associations. Associations ran teams. Almost every city in America had a baseball team. But at some point, someone who owned a baseball team decided, well, nobody wants to really pay to come see the Brooklyn Dodgers pound the. Cleveland nobodies into the ground 16 nothing by the second inning. So you had this kind of move to capture the spectacle. So capture that competition, capture, you know, the, the sport played at its highest level. So all of a sudden you had the formation of the National League uh, in America where I think it was originally six or eight teams. 
Uh, so it went from a player run uh, kind of association where there's lots of teams, everybody gets to play baseball, everybody gets their moment, to here are the very few teams that get to play baseball. And it was part about it was part of capturing that spectacle. I think you see that uh, in esports, especially right now, um, with things like uh, as organizations are collapsing, folding. You know, talent is moving around. You see, lol uh, or riot, I should say. Uh, everybody that plays their games competitively is automatically an employee of the company. So you see this kind of consolidation happening. You see parallels, especially with uh, kind of the professionalization of sports, um, as kind of a longer history. But I think those parallels could easily be drawn to to other leisure activities for sure, because uh, we've seen the meta game, for example. The first time we started referencing that in the literature was through sociology, and it was about poker because poker has a metagame. Uh, so one last question. Um, I was just wondering if you have considered or have any insights into the fighting game community at all, and specifically um, Smash Bros. Melee, which um, players just want to jump on the console. Oh, nice. And it's a, it's a game that can't be played online. It has to be played you know, in uh, the same room on a CRT TV. It's a game that's been around for over a decade. And even now they're saying it's entering its platinum age, and it's going to be an MLG. Nice. I, I can say, uh, insofar as I, there's, a, I think it's uh, The Work of Play, is a book about um, uh, basically, it, Hung is the author, I cannot remember his first name at the moment, but uh, in The Work of Play, he actually looks specifically at fighting games. Um, so, not Smash Brothers, but basically, your Tekken, I think he looks a little bit at Street Fighter. Uh, and looks at kind of you know the way gamers approach that and starts to break down kind of things like sparring versus actually competing versus actually you know practicing where you're just trying to figure out the moves and get the execution right and and kind of get the chains down uh, and things like that so uh, for me I'm I'm at this point now open because I'm not uh, part of the my approach uh, to this study is that I have to be open to wherever my participants take me so last year when I was giving this presentation I said nope StarCraft is gonna be the game I'm gonna study well I've kind of backed off of that a little bit because I don't know uh, I have contacted a local gaming group uh, I'm hoping to actually work through them partially uh, in terms of my study but like I say I do want to kind of recruit all sorts of other gamers uh, to see uh, if the same things are happening, if they're happening at the same level, uh, so you know, does the fact that uh, you know a fighting game like Smash Brothers, uh, does the fact that it's not online, you know, alter the way this game is played or kind of change the way the landscape is? Uh, and I would point uh, towards. Uh, there are ways of actually networking these games now too. Uh, I've uh, kind of been poking around the retro gaming scene, um, both the buy it from a store and find it on the internet uh, scene and uh, you know they're finding ways to, to take these retro games through emulators and actually network them so in theory you can play you know the original uh, Smash Brothers online uh, with a friend through your PC uh, I don't necessarily endorse that um, because it may or may not be illegal I'm not sure uh, so something to think about but yeah I think that's a it's an interesting point I think that uh, it's an interesting genre because it is definitely at the forefront of arcade competition. Uh, fighting games have always been a part of the arcade. It's always been about being there in the arcade, the spectacle of watching two people, you know, kind of fight in the arcade. And uh, I, I think it's been an important part of the development of, of competitive, uh, professional competitive uh, gaming, for sure. I think that's it. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, for coming and uh, listening. Uh, and hopefully next year I will have uh, some kind of preliminary stuff to talk about in terms of the stories I want to tell. And uh, I'll hopefully see you all then. <laughs> Thanks.
player base uh, from all different skill levels. Cool. Um, so you might be able to get in touch with them and see if you can get access to this assessment. Even possibly win a match by the sound of it. Thanks. Hello. Thanks for talking. Oh, Excellent. Thanks for coming. I'm actually a Street Fighter player. Ah, cool. I'm starting to brush up against the, the pro community because I'm just trying to get better at the game. Uh, and pretty much all of your theory, all the concepts you're talking about are transferable to that. Cool. Same with other first-person shooters as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's usually characterized as a jock culture first-person shooters, but I found that this is kind of the thing I find interesting about gaming is all the same kind of analysis is done, like positionality on a map. You know, where do you go? Where do you not go? When you're standing at this corner, where do you look? Where do you not look? These things are all kind of, you know, it's it's the knowledge that is being accumulated by this community, and if you don't look at it, it's at your own peril. <laughs> For sure. You're talking about the. The participation shaping the, the game, uh, what Capcom's doing with Street Fighter 4 now, like the new update they're doing, like the changes they're making to the game are directly related to how it's being played at pro level. Oh, cool. They're, they're altering the game mechanics to essentially push play in the way that they want to see it go and what they're getting for feedback. It's, hmm. it's actually very interactive. Yeah, yeah, it's. Which is interesting because I. I casual or not, you're affected by it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It impacts what you're doing. So I, you know, for some of us, it definitely makes the game more interesting. It makes it something that, you know, you can dive into more. For others, uh, you know, it makes the game impenetrable. So I find that that, that tension is interesting. Uh, because, I mean, you look at EA, yeah, they're not really interested in making the NHL games uh, <laughs> eSports games, or their baseball games eSports games. And I think part of that is, you know, they want a game with wide appeal rather than a game with kind of appeal, uh, and uh, you know, I'll talk about some of this, uh, but it's, it's, you know, these games have appeal, they have a built-in kind of support group <laughs> if you want to really get into it, but uh, you're going to have to consult the support group, because if you don't, it's just demoralizing. Soul crushing, really. Uh, <laughs> I don't play uh, uh, on the ladder anymore, I just can't. <laughs> but I will eventually, uh, soon, uh, probably. I give you some Oh, sure. Yeah, yep. like sure, sure. Thank you. Oh, I hope I brought enough. Absolutely. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Sounds good to me. Sure. First off, uh, do you know much about the, like, the FGC, the fighting game community, the, the last question I mentioned? Uh, no. Um, in the fighting game community, I personally don't know a lot about it, but they are, um, as far as I'm aware, they're like um, aggressively anti what MLG stands for. They don't <laughs> enjoy the culture, they don't enjoy the sort of attitude that engenders. Um, yep. I had a friend that, like, whose first experience with like MLG and professional gaming is like, he's going to a Halo tournament and being told that you aren't supposed to use that gun. It's wrong. It's yeah. bad. It's not how you're supposed to play. That one doesn't work because it's not, you know. It's so everyone was just like running around with pistols and he was like, no, this is dumb. This isn't how games are supposed to be enjoyed. Games are mm. fun. They are for serious. So mm. the, ammo, the uh, fighting game community is much more about um, the game as a source of fun and enjoyment and also competition. Mm -hmm. Going back to like the arcades, how you're playing with your friends in a local community. But, um, yeah, I think it would be worth some looking into because MLG is a perspective, but it's not all of the perspective. No, for sure. Yeah, uh, it's definitely... Um, uh, and the question that I had was, uh, when a lot of... I don't know if this is a thing that really happens anymore, but like a couple years back, um, whenever like a first-person shooter came out or an RTS came out, not all the time, but mm -hmm. for a lot of them, there was always a question hung around was, is it going to be an eSport? Are they going to have like replay support? Are they going to yeah. have casters? Are they going to have this, that, and the other? And um, uh, it was just sort of weird to see that like as an oversaturization. Uh, as a problem. Um, do you have any insight to that? Like, I think that uh, MOBAs are going to push us there for sure. I think that question is going to be very much up for grabs. Um, are we getting oversaturated? Is this you know, worth the development time? Because I mean, it, you look at World of Tanks for example, a game that you know, has been around for a number of years, has been doing kind of their, their thing in Russia, and it's been you know, a nice expansion to the rest of the world, but now they're being pushed into well, you need replay support, and if you want to be an eSport, you need these things and those things. And, you know, whether or not that community will bear that burden, I think, is going to be interesting to see as they transition and as they try to grow uh, that particular game. Uh, and it, it is something that, you know, it, it takes resources. It takes money and time and programmers, and, you know, you can't just 
slap together replay in a day. Yes. It, it takes time to put it into the code. And then when you have people playing at that high level, when you have that metagame happening, you know, and this tank is all of a sudden, you know, you can't do that tank anymore because it's not going, it doesn't have, you know, the, the right whatever, or the right angles. You know, it, these things become interesting. And I think uh, MMOs are also feeling it. Like outside of esports, you know, the MMO genre, you look at the last few releases, you know, Star Wars, The Old Republic, so on and so forth. Uh, our instrumental drive in games and this kind of community that is supportive of games also drives these games to be, you know, very quickly consumed. Uh, so we get WoW Syndrome. You get to end game in all of these games, which is always level 50 or 60 or whatever. And then you go back to WoW because that's where you have all of the real end game gear that you've now spent, you know, the last 10 years doing. I think uh, the most interesting developed probably in that genre in the last little while has been the Elder Scrolls Online, which said, well, everybody has uh, a vertically uh, based progression system. Let's make it horizontal. So their progression system is now spread over like, oh, I don't know, I think it's like a dozen categories or something. Uh, so you can basically, there, there is no, or it's resistant to, at least so far, the here is the way you play this class. Here is the way you play that class. Got to go. I just have to set up for the next cool, cool. Uh, panel. Actually, I have to go make sure there's sound there. I might have next one, too. So. Thank you very much. Uh,
Yeah, we're gonna yeah. need the bond just so we okay. can help just amplify everything. So we're gonna just take those guys. Next, close the stage. Just crank it up because there's just gonna be a lot of ambient yeah. noise. Okay. And we'll take these chairs down. Okay, everybody, okay. backstage. I, I gotta finish setting this up. So yep, we gotta get these chairs off stage too. He's got it. I got it. Thank you. That's what I'm here for. Uh, um, so, 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 so,